Well, welcome to the session on social metabolism and land use change. I'm pleased that you're here. I try to have an exciting 90 minutes with you. Uh, my name is Helmut Havel. I will chair this session. I will give an introductory flash talk, and then we have uh, four other presentations. So we have a little bit more time than other sessions. We will try to have presentations of up to 15 minutes and then have three minutes of discussion time for each of the presentations. Okay. Uh, I don't know to what extent you're familiar with this idea of social metabolism. Uh, the idea is that you look at, for example, if you look at it at a national scale, you look at a national economy as a system of material and energy flows. So material and energy is extracted from the environment, uh, then taken as resources in production and consumption processes through artifacts, transport processes, products flowing to the population who use them. There may be reuse and recycling loops. Uh, and wastes and emissions are uh, then handed over to the environment again at the end of social metabolism. Uh, this concept is quite venerable and old. It can be traced back to the mid of the 19th century, actually, if you want like, if one likes. So Jean Martinez Allier has written a famous book about that. Um, in any case, uh, it, it has been, it has developed into a process, uh, in, into a, in, into a generic tool that is all meanwhile used, for example, in national statistics, in Eurostat statistics to account for material flows associated with economic activities. Uh, and I will focus on, on ongoing work to look a little bit more on the buildup of, of material stocks, of artifacts, buildings, infrastructures, machinery, uh, and how they influence um, um, resource use, resource use efficiency, and de delivery of services. Uh, and of course, the focus of the session today is how, what, what is the implication of this process for land. And obviously, parts of these resources are taken from land ecosystems like forestry, cropping, grazing. Uh, others are taken from uh, fossil deposits like fossil fuels or minerals. Uh, they, they, their land demand is not very high. but uh, also, of course, all these uh, buildings, infrastructures, they also need area, and this also affects land systems. Um, okay, so if, if we look at the land system in this perspective, we, it's, it's quite useful to look at land use as a colonization of terrestrial ecosystems. That's a concept we use at the Institute of Social Ecology. And the idea is that society invests work or energy or builds up stocks to transform natural ecosystems into colonized terrestrial ecosystems. Uh, and you may look at the change this induces uh, in, in terrestrial ecosystems, for example. And you may look that, you may see that we may change forests, wetlands, natural ecosystems into uh, systems like infrastructure areas, cropland, grazing land, forestry. Of course, in order to gain services like materials, like biomass, for example, but also to gain certain services like, for example, transport services that require infrastructures where you can drive a car, for example, or a train. Um, and yeah, uh, this, has, this concept actually has been uh, used in land use science. I've been a member of the SSC of the GLP in the uh, first decade of this century uh, for several years, and, and this has contributed to, to things you have seen, for example, in the introductory keynote lecture by Heinz Erb, like the human appropriation of net primary production, the consequences it has for uh, land ecosystems, uh, or for example, for, for the carbon turnover, the speed with which these uh, ecosystems work, uh, and the carbon stock in these ecosystems. So I will not go into this because I think the land, global land uh, science community is quite familiar with that. I will look into a new direction which we are at the moment opening at the Institute of Social Ecology. And this session is very much focused towards looking at this new direction, uh, which is uh, looking deeper into this uh, system of material flows 
Uh, and from, I, I can very well remember in the early 90s, we said we were very excited with this concept and we said, well, this is a great concept because you can close the balance between inflows and outflows and this helps you to understand outflows. We know that waste statistics are very bad. You can use, get a consistent picture of, 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 the, of the whole economy in terms of material flows. You cannot only do it on the level of the national economy. You can do it from the household level to the global level, uh, wherever you find the data to do it. Uh, in, any, in any case, this promise to close uh, the balance between inflows and outflows has very long not been fulfilled. Yeah? And only since like something like 10 years, people in industrial ecology and social metabolism research try to really do this. And we found quite interesting things, and I will share those with you here, uh, which is that these stocks are hugely important. So, uh, so if you want to close the balance between extraction and, and outputs of wastes and emissions, you have to close this balance. What do we put on stocks? So what new stocks do we build? Uh, what is the demolition of, 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 uh, of stocks that have reached the end of their lifetime? Uh, and of course, it's interesting to also look at these recycling flows. Uh, and what you see, see here is this yellow one is fossil fuels. Of course, they are used dissipatively. The green one is biomass, and most of biomass is also used dissipatively. Only a small fraction goes into stocks, like paper that goes to libraries, or wood, timber that goes to, to roofs, roof constructions or wood buildings. Uh, most of it is used dissipatively. Of course, half, more than half of it is animal feed, so it is by definition used dissipatively. Another part is human food, and there's also an, a lot of short-lived products. Uh, so one thing is when we talk about, see this picture, and we talk about circular economy, you immediately see that with this massive buildup of stocks, of course, we cannot become very circular indeed. Yeah? So we will need a lot of additional raw materials, even if we are better in closing these loops, if, even if we raise our recycling rates, just as an aside. So we have now a 100-year uh, time, uh, seri time series of, uh, build up of stocks and the interesting thing here is this black line this is a share of stock building materials that has risen from a little bit over 20 percent uh, around 20 percent in 1900 to 55 percent now so the fraction of materials we use to build up these stocks is rising massively so we are on the way to stockpiling society we're still also on the way to throwaway society <laughs> But stockpiling is even more important. Uh, so that's just the development of global material stocks. And just one point to this. This is absolutely one-to-one -one with global GDP, real GDP, inflation-correlated co GDP. There's absolutely no decoupling happen happening. Yeah? All the decoupling results from using flows more efficiently, but not from using stocks more efficiently. So Whatever that means for resource efficiency policies is beyond the scope of this session, but still a quite sobering result. Um, well, and why are these stocks so important? They transform resources into services, such as shelter, nutrition, mobility. Building up and maintaining these stocks requires a huge amount of resources, as you have seen. Uh, but very importantly, if you look at these stocks, this is Brussels. You see some very important stocks like uh, 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 train station, buildings. Uh, they shape social practices, so they shape our consumption behavior. Uh, and they are very important and efficient in doing so. If you have certain infrastructures, people will use them. So if you build roads, people will drive on them with their cars. And then you get into trouble in decarbonizing that activity. Yeah? You may also choose to build railroads you can decarbonize them much more easily. Yeah? They need less energy to begin with anyway. But So these decisions on infrastructures are hugely important for sustainability. Um, and just one number that has raised quite a lot of uh, interest in the IPCC community. Uh, if we use the existing infrastructures until the end of their planned lifetimes, we will more or less entirely exhaust 
the emission budget for the 1.5 degree target. Yeah? Uh, only the existing infrastructures, we are of course building infrastructures like MAD, as you've seen, <laughs> new infrastructures. You may know that until 2050, half of the cities that people in 2050 will live in still have to be built. Yeah? So you may see what kind of a challenge this means. Yeah? Uh, anyway, so one specific characteristic of stocks that is very important for land change science is that stocks are located in space. So you can map them. And you will see one presentation uh, by Franz Schuch, uh, who actually produced this uh, figure. Thanks for that. <laughs> uh, this is Vienna, the Danube. This is Vienna, the Danube. This is St. Pölten. You see the main transportation lines. Uh, so this mapping of stocks has an influence, of course, for land system because they influence the land system, but also uh, because they structure the land system in space. Uh, they co-determine resource efficiency, so for different patterns of such stocks, of settlement patterns, for example, of locations of workplaces and, uh, and places where people live. They are hugely important for uh, energy demand for transportation. Uh, and, of course, they, they, det they, they determine where services are available and where they are not available. Uh, I wanted to use this one. So, for example, if you want to see a doctor, it will be a lot easier here than here, quite obviously. No? So the spatial distribution of availability of important services is very much dependent on the location of these stocks. Um, yeah. And so this is, this is the thing we are working on at the moment. It, we call it the, the stock flow service nexus. So the question is, how can we design material and energy flows that are compatible with ecological limits, for example, compatible with the 1.5 degree target, which means huge changes in the way we use resources. And we will not be able to achieve them without very different patterns of material stocks, very different infrastructures better houses, for example, in terms of insulation, but also different patterns in um, spatial structures, how we organize our life. Uh, and services we put here because it's a, a concept that comes from basically two strands. One is from energy research, where you have this concept of energy services. Uh, and, of course, also from land use science, where you have this concept of uh, ecosystem services, that we try to look at this uh, to go beyond this very simple econom economic e concept of efficiency. It's just dividing GDP by the energy used is, I think, a little bit too, too, too little complex. I think with such a picture, you can learn a lot more on how to provide the services we need efficiently. So this is my last slide. Um, the, I think I've shown that the, the focus so far is land as providing resources, this continues to be hugely important to land change science, of course. Uh, and and the, the concept developed using the social metabolism idea still play quite a big role in land change science here. But I think this new direction is also important. What, what do these spatial patterns of material stocks mean for structuring land use landscapes and spatial patterns and service provision? And this idea of stock flow service nexus may help to achieve more sustainable social metabolism. One of the really crucial challenges we are working on is how to define these services. We have a trade-off between measurability yeah, uh, and their value to really learn more about contribution of these services for well-being. Yeah. Uh, this is a tension. Uh, if you want them to be measurable, they are less well linked to well-being. If you want them to be linked with well-being, they are <laughs> almost impossible to measure, at least quantitatively. So this also raises this issue of linking qualitative research with uh, quantitative research, which, which is, of course, quite difficult. And I, as far as I know, Christoph will <laughs> talk a little bit about this right after my talk now. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Some PR activity now from my side. <laughs> um, yes, uh, if there's any urgent question, I will allow this. Otherwise, I will now switch hats. Unfortunately, the two other chairs of this session couldn't come to this one. One of those couldn't make it here, unfortunately. The other one was allocated to three parallel sessions, so obviously he can't split. 
<laughs> personality, so <laughs> I have to do the chairing alone. So I would now switch to chairing. Thank you very much. You know? Yeah, that's okay. Okay, then again, uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you, Helmut, for this introduction. I will directly follow this introduction or introductory remarks from Helmut and focus on one specific aspect of our research, how we can use this stock flow service nexus that Helmut explained in the detail, or in, in, in the general aspect, I will also focus on more details, for transformational research. Um, this is an ongoing work, and unfortunately, I cannot uh, present uh, final results here today. Uh, it's more about conceptual work and also about uh, yeah, building on formal research. But I think I can uh, um, give uh, an, an, as an idea about what transformation research in this uh, area may um, show or may look like. As is a large discussion at our institute, and some of the colleagues are very involved in this uh, deb debate, maybe also others than that mentioned here exactly, and also from other institutes. But here um, uh, I will present some, yeah, the core um, uh, considerations on how we can make use of this work for transformation research. And this directly starts with this uh, with this slide that also Helmut shows before. Um, this. It's not only very interesting in terms of stockpiling and not throw away society, it's also very in interesting for transformation because if you look closer at this, you see two things. You see first, there's no going down, no um, uh, more, more, uh, evidence for efficiency or so something like this. This is still ongoing and it's very parallel to what is discussed in air system science as great acceleration. You see, in the middle of the 20th century, you see a, a very strong increase in resource use and the, the part uh, of this research that goes in, into um, stocks even increased also in the uh, second part of the century. Is this this one? No. no. But, um, yeah, and uh, you see at the end on the right side in 2010, you see no evidence that there is any way to uh, handle this challenge uh, for human society. So uh, this presents a yeah, huge challenge for any kind of transformation towards a sustainable society. Yeah? Yeah. And uh, to see to see the whole picture, it's also important that what Helmut just mentioned, that uh, stocks play a very important role uh, for the development of societies. No? The stocks uh, provide uh, or enable certain modes of production and living, and we all depend on this, uh, even from mobility, but also from communication. We all depend on infras IT infrastructure, for example. Um, at this uh, established infrastructure, the term in further resource use, you, you need, uh, for example, energy, or you need to repair construction material to repair this infrastructure, and it's very difficult to change the, 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 pass, the pathway. So it's very uh, difficult to create alternative pathways. So this is a challenge also for the transformation research. And what I said before, current trajectory, trajectories give no evidence that there is an easy way to change this. Uh, we have um, in this established infrastructure a major obstacle, or represents a major obstacle for sustainable resource levels. And there is no evidence, as I said before, that resource eff efficiency is effective. We can't see that there is a going down of this trajectory. And uh, uh, the recent transformations we have in our data, we see that even since 2004, there is an even a stronger increase in the, the stock building uh, resources, the use of uh, resources for stock building in this way. So there is uh, even a, what we have called preliminary as a second great acceleration, that means even stronger than, in a similar way than after the Second World War, you see, we see some uh, an increase after 2004. So the question is, 
how we can identify, how we can help from a scientific perspective to identify alternative pathways. And here we want make, to make use from this uh, stock flow service nexus as a conceptual starting point for an alternative way beyond looking for only for efficiency, but looking really for alternative options. This is the, uh, the basic <laughs> figure for our research. And the idea is, as I said before, to reduce uh, or to show options for reducing um, resource use by uh, identifying alternative options. That means, of course, we can mobility, we can um, provide this service in a, in a very different way by bicycles here in Bern. Uh, it's very efficient to have this bicycle uh, system. You have this very good public transport. You have, of course, a car. Um, also, um, different way, combustion engines, electric en energies, but we have also flights, and this, mean, this is meant by, we have different options to provide uh, services like mobility. And this is uh, what, what we want to um, address with our research. But this, as, as Helmut says before, needs clari clar clarity about what actually are services and how they are distinct from uh, fl other flows and from, uh, yeah, we will see also from physical aspects. And the next point is also uh, how we can determine, how we can identify alternatives. And even more important is the last point, how we can implement such transformation pathways. Very often also here at the conference, we see only from a scientific perspective to identify options. But very often it is ignored what actually is going on uh, in societies while creating this kind of uh, yeah, research, uh, research stocks, but maybe also other kind of land use. And here we have to look for the obstacles, for the uh, problems by implementing this. Only then we can really make a contribution to transformative research. The first step, we try to clarify these services and their rele relevance or their distinctions from services to functions and to uh, values and benefits. And here we make use of an, um, a, a figure that maybe most of you know, as it's from the ecosystem service debate. It's one of the um, predecessors of our dis discussion, the papers from Marianne Potchin and Rory Hens Young, so make this er ecosystem, er ecosystem service cascade. And we use this to make these con uh, this conceptual distinctions between services and other elements. And here, of course, this is differently because here the stocks are not natural stocks. stocks. The stocks here are biophysical and man-made or colonized nature, as uh, Helmut also explains this. But important is here the distinction between functions Yeah, functions, services, and benefits, maybe also the values that um, are provided by these material or the biophysical dimensions of uh, societies. What we can learn from this, uh, and here is particularly interested, we will see for stocks is who benefits actually and why are people benefiting from some services and maybe have also problems with other services. Very important uh, point is uh, that we also detected in this paper or described in this paper that we have to make the distinction between the physical work and the societal service. For example, if you want to have um, uh, the service of mobility, that means you want to go to your office, commuting to your office, it's not person kilometer, that's normally the uh, uh, physical work, the person kilometer you want to go, but you want to achieve this in an easy way, and more person kilometer is not a better service. So we have to make a clear um, a distinction between what actually is um, uh, demanded by the services and not uh, what is delivered in, physical, in terms of physical work. Also very important is the next uh, distinction between the benefits and the, uh, the, the services and the benefits. Because if you if a new road is created that, that, that you can achieve your uh, that you can uh, reach your uh, your office slightly faster, maybe this creates this benefits for people in the neighborhood who have um, more noise or more air pollution. So benefits for for some people are not benefits. Maybe are these benefits or these uh, uh, obstacles or costs for others. And this is very often the case for all for other um, uh, um, uh, services. 
And he, therefore, uh, this is the reason that you see that most creation of benefit, uh, most creation of stocks are highly contested. If you see, I guess, you know, in your countries, you can all remember examples where the building of roads, of airports, of uh, pipelines or something like this is heavily contested because it creates advantages and disadvantages. And this is very often also the case, while it's very difficult, for example, to build such, uh, to, uh, such stocks, for example, Stuttgart 21 or international. There's a high debate on these pipelines towards to, uh, to Russia, the North Stream and the South Stream and so on. Maybe also more important is the Belt and Road Initiative that you know as uh, the new Silk Road or so, something like this. It's basically about roads uh, and uh, trains, uh, train systems, but also in harbors. And it is very much linked to geostrategic uh, uh, consideration that means power relations. And this is, that makes this highly contested. So because of um, the fact that all infrastructures are spatially explicit, they, ha they are restructuring societies in terms of some uh, spaces are closer to each other then, but others maybe also are marginali marginalized uh, because therefore of this restructuring of societies this is highly untested and it's very difficult how these is, are implemented. The states or states in the, in the plural in the international area plays a very important role. Here we go to the concept of provisioning systems. Provisioning systems is an uh, approach to analyze this link between biophysical dimensions of societies and the services they provide. Uh, they are used in several uh, projects, uh, also, for example, in this Lilly project, Living Well Within Limits by Julia Steinberger. But we refer, we refer here to another concept or to another operationalization of this concept uh, by the Institute of Social Ecology in, in uh, Frankfurt, where they, have this, uh, where they have developed this concept in the context of ecosystem service research. And here, very important are the links that this is a systemic approach that links nature and society, but at the same time here we have actors, we have practices and knowledge, technology and institutions, so we can analyze how this is shaped and restructured. And this is very important for an anal analysis of ongoing transformation. Um, and here uh, the last slide, or the, no, the, the second, um, not the final slide, but uh, here we try to compile these different um, starting points in one, f uh, um, uh, one graph where we try to uh, link this uh, provisioning systems approach to our discussions on the energy cascade. And uh, if we start with resource flows and uh, resources provided for the uh, building up of structure, uh, of biophysical structures to colonize nature, but also the functions, that means the energy or construction material that is, that is used to pro provide this functioning uh, ongoing. We have an en enabling and restriction um, um, link between the biophysical structures and the services they provide, the benefits and the interests that uh, are there at the end. But at the same time, as it means uh, these this, this, uh, stocks uh, enable, but also restrict the options for services and um, the benefits. But at the same time, we have also a link the other way around that uh, interests and values define the benefits. So uh, benefits are the benefits for those who have specific interests or specific values. For example, going fast with your car to your office, maybe the others say, oh, I would not like uh, to, have a, to have a road, I would like to have public transport, for example. No? That depends on the interests and values. So the benefits maybe are totally different. And also the service required for this. No? For um, this uh, benefit, um, maybe public transport services are much more important. Uh, this also select and modifies the uh, colonized nature. The bring intentions into the colonization of this nature and here um, uh, yeah, identify what actually pr uh, will provide these uh, services. So on here you can also look at the knowledges and the technology that is involved in this definition and the construction of uh, services and so on, but also on the other hand the actors and the institutions that are involved. All these um, uh, building blocks or these elements are in the entry points for empirical um, investigations. We can analyze 
this, uh, the actors involved, we can analyze which kind of knowledge is used to define services. Very often, it's only a technical knowledge, but maybe it's a knowledge that is more, pro more comprehensive and uh, integrates other kind of values, for example. And that is also important for the technologies uh, that are um, used to create this um, biophysical structures and so on. You, um, for example, it's very important which kind of actors are really involved in the in the definition and uh, the uh, uh, yeah the definition of um, of uh, services. Is that only um, uh, experts or it's the local uh, local people uh, population also involved? And at the end, it's about institutions and the state who really uh, try to. Um, provide legitimate uh, answers, but also resolve the, uh, the conflicts around this. And all this uh, happens in time and space. There is nothing that happens somewhere, it happens in concrete places, and this is very often the, the point where roads are built, uh, where, uh, of course, pipelines are built, and so on. These are all our entry points, and we can ask questions uh, like this. Who defines, actually, the services? Who shapes the colonized nature, who, is made them, who, are, who are major actors involved in this um, shaping or in this colonization of nature, and who controls really this, this process at the end. And this is more a question of the state and the uh, institutions involved. So I come to my last slide <laughs> on time. Um, yeah, as I said, it's very, um, infrastructures and or all stocks are highly contested because they are restructuring global societies. Um, and provisioning services, from our perspective, provide an, 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 a starting point for the empirical analysis. Uh, but unfortunately, as I said in the beginning, we are only at the beginning to, um, to analyze this. We have now we had we had intensive uh, intensive debates about what could be a good example, and we at the end we are thinking about providing the link between urbanization and mobility and focus on twin cities, twin capitals like Vienna and Bratislava. Um, maybe this is, uh, this is not a final decision made on this, but we can think that there are very interesting uh, conflicts involved, for example. We have the conflicts on the Vienna airport, but we have also uh, conflicts on the constructions of highways uh, and the conflicts between highways and uh, protection areas and so on. So we, we are convinced that that is a good uh, starting point to analyze the strategic selectivity that is, in, uh, that is in, um, incorporated in existing states. All states are looking only for solutions towards economic growth. The conflict resolution is all, always in a direction that uh, other options are not um, really favored by the, by the existing states. So um, what we can achieve, that, uh, what we can see here is that it is very important to have a critical approach of the state and their impact on the creation of stocks and the transformative capacities involved. Thank you very much. Yeah, I totally agree. This is exactly the point why I have this uh, two arrows, no, not only in one direction, and this is not a cascade uh, yet. No, this is a totally different approach because uh, we have to analyze the way societies define what uh, are the real, yeah, you say capital, I would say, what are the real, uh, the relevance of biophysical structures for society is to some degree decided by societies. Of course, they are limited in their 
the, uh, the options what they can define, but uh, at the end it's important which kind of, for example, what, what, uh, what are the stocks that are really important for providing mobility. Uh, there you can have, you have different options and this is decided using societies. And here we can make a starting point for looking for uh, identifying alternative, alternative options. So this is exactly what you mentioned. You have to look at the more interactive way between nature and society. Perfect. Does it work? It does. It does work. Yeah. Thank you, Helmut. Thank you, uh, Christoph, and thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Franz Schuk, and I will uh, present recent research from my PhD studies, which are about using remote sensing data for material stock mapping and quantification. So I will not um, go into the details of the concept of stocks because the the two previous presentations did that. But I will just go right into the idea of the study that we have. So currently there. Are we think that there are two major approaches to how to map um, material stocks. The first one is a rather inflow-driven approach. You can, you can see that as a maybe, as a maybe a top-down approach. So you have statistics on a national level, for example, for stock inflows, outflows, extraction, um, exportation, domestic use, and we all have seen that in the uh, recent presentations. You can deduce stock estimations for a certain area, and the advantage is that you can do that over very large areas with, for example, national on a national level or even global level. And the second approach is a rather stock-driven approach that uh, works off a single feature, meaning you go to a single feature, you measure the stock quantities that, that it holds, and then you can make um, estimations based on the kind of that feature over larger areas. And the advantage is that it is actually pretty accurate. So we think that we can have um, an approach in between that using remote sensing data, and we think that we can do that because Remote sensing offers also a top-down perspective on very large areas, but also at a fairly high resolution spatially. Remote sensing is already widely used for land cover mapping and land use mapping, so um, it gives us hints on stock-related feature. It is uh, an independent data source, and with recent sensors, we have uh, nearly worldwide coverage with consistent data of 10 to 20 meter spatial resolution. And we have also a large method set available at hand to um, automated image analysis. <coughs> so we aim for a three-step approach. In the first step, we map built-up surfaces and human-made infrastructures. This is what you know as land cover mapping, and we do that in order to answer the question, where do we have to look for stocks? The second step is that we want to identify a typology of characteristics of settlements and infrastructure to answer the questions, what kind of, what kind of areas, what kind of infrastructures and settlements are we looking at? And then third, derive with that information, uh, the material stock quantities and then patterns and distributions from it. Uh, I do need to bother you with some slides on remote sensing methods and data. So we're currently using Copernicus Sentinel data, Sentinel-2 optical and Sentinel-1 radar data at the expense of maybe higher resolution and maybe more accurate, uh, very high resolution data. But we work on the resolution of 10 to 20 meters because potentially we want the method to be applicable uh, applicable globally, and we do not want to rely on very specific regional uh, or national data sources. The method we use for the first step um, for the land cover mapping is a machine learning regression algorithm that requires a library of pure multispectral land members, meaning that we go to an image, we collect um, pure surfaces and their spectra, we artificially mix them at different steps. For example, this is a vegetation <coughs> spectrum, this is a building spectrum, and we have different artificial mixtures that we use as a training input for the regression. And we use a regression because we do not want to make a discrete land cover classification, as many maps do, but we want to have a land cover fraction map. And this is one of the maps that we produced. You've seen that in Helmut's version, although Helmut's version was a pretty, um, meanwhile, outdated <laughs> uh, version with lots of errors that, well, <laughs> um, that we updated. Shortly to explain, you see three bands, red, green, and blue. Red is built-up area and infrastructure. Green is forest, and 
blue is other vegetation, which mainly includes um, uh, agricultural uh, cultivations uh, and grasslands. We also have a soil layer, but soil is, let's say, um, infinitely exciting for the city of Vienna, which you see here. Um, and for each pixel, you have those three values in percentage. I mean, for each pixel, you can, you can have sub-pixel information on how many percent of that area is built up and infrastructure surface, how many percent is forest, and how many percent is other vegetation. And we will zoom in on three areas. This is now for the city of Berlin, Germany, um, to see what the advantages of, of that approach could be. So we have an agricultural site here. We have fractions of forests, which is actually an orchard, uh, and we have an adjacent village structure. We have here um, a medium density residential area. Green is forest, so in this case, this is uh, street green and street trees. And we have a very low density um, residential leisure garden structure with an industrial site. And this is a, a canal, like a channel. Um, and we think that this is the better approach because this um, this is a map that we produced. This is a continuous layer from zero to one, fractions of built up infrastructure. Um, oh yeah, I forgot that it, that includes roads, rail. Um, we don't call it impervious because there's gravel and sand and, 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 and those things. And we think that here we can make statements about the, like the, the character of, of the respective site. So we can make statements about density. Uh, I have the pointer. We can make statements about density, obviously. We can make statements about the structure of the respective objects, even. This is 10 meter resolution, but we, that is sufficient for major objects of the urban uh, landscape. And we think that we can apply uh, sophisticated raster statistics and landscape metrics and any kind of statistics on that, which provides information that globally available products that are binary in many cases, such as the global urban footprint or global human settlement layer, may not be able to provide. Um, two things that we are currently working on from a methodological stand standpoint. In remote sensing, you always have to wonder what, what image do I use? Like, um, and what do I want to map? What is the real surface that I want to see? So this is an agricultural, um, those are agricultural fields. The vegetation in May 2018 and their soil in August 2018. So what, what do we want to map? Now, you might want to say for material stocks mapping, agriculture may not be the most prevalent thing that we want to see. But we also know that especially for soil surfaces, we have a lot of spectral resemblance to materials that are actually used for building things. So um, clay and sands that we have in the surrounding soils, we often see them in the build up, in the, in the build up areas as well. And we do want to avoid that confusion. And then second, when we want to go over large areas, we do not always want to decide for each of the study sites that we look at, uh, what is the image that we want to use, what's the data availability, and this is why we use uh, spectral statistics for that. So we have uh, an image stack of Sentinel-2 scenes for one year, um, and we calculate pixel-wise statistics, meaning, for example, a maximum spectrum, a minimum spectrum, a median spectrum, and many more. This is just an example. And with that variation, we cover the phenological uh, information in the respective time series. Uh, we're currently doing systematic feature quality analysis. The, the, um, the graphs uh, are not so important. It's just to show that we do science. Um, <laughs> um, evaluate a multiple number of, of models and different input features and see what kind of model can, or what kind of spectral information can give us robust and stable models over large areas such as uh, a country, for example. And then the second thing is, um, our approach is spatially very explicit. That means that we go into images and we take the spectra from the actual site. And there are methods such as symbolic machine learning, for example, that are independent of space, but our approach is not. And the question is how regional do, do our models have to be? So can we model a country with one model? Possibly yes, we're trying to figure that out. But can we model a continent with one model? Possibly not, because the phenological attributes and the materials used for the actual buildings and uh, features you see are different. And then we wonder how can we generalize the models that we use and can existing frameworks such as biomes, for example, or ecoregions, um, mainly in terms of phenology or ur urban ecoregions or other um, established concepts uh, help us to delineate the, the regionality of the model that we use. Uh, this is an experimental excursion 
Here we used Sentinel-1 radar backscatter information over one year for distinguishing buildings from other built-up surfaces, uh, flat impervious surfaces, uh, railways and such. Uh, you see a river, which is obviously an error still. Um, you see built-up, meaning buildings in red, roads and other infrastructure in green, and forest and trees in blue. And um, well, visually we see errors, but aggregated on a 90 meter level, which might be actually enough for material stocks estimation, we see that we can produce fairly good results. Um, this does unfortunately not include height, so it's just building or no building, building or other infrastructure. Um, yeah, so the next step will be, how can we make statements about what, what, what is the kind of settlement or the kind of infrastructure that we see? And we are doing a literature review and, and working on a framework or, or examining existing frameworks of what could be target features or indicators for settlement characteristics. So what can we take into account to say, uh, this is uh, this kind of area and this is this kind of neighborhood, for example. And here we can think about multiple things. Uh, I showed land cover maps. Where's the pointer to say? Land cover maps. Think about building density. We've seen that visually. We can think about building height, urban form, structure types. <coughs> um, like, what is the, oh. anyway. Um, do we have green components in that area? What are the functional types? Is it a res residential area, commercial area, and so on? Um, some of them we can map with remote sensing data. Some of them we maybe cannot map with remote sensing data. Structure types you cannot see if, a, if the building structure is wooden, if it's a brick structure, if it's a concrete structure because it's underneath the surface. So that might be approximated by other in indicators that we can map. And I want to show what the idea is, how that could work for one of one example. Um, Let's take the, the functional types, for example. So we think that we can make a regular grid or a hexagonal grid or a squared grid or whatever the, the size might be. Um, we overlay different indicators such as land cover or others. We use additional remote sensing data or other data that we have at hand. Then we apply a method and then we have functional types. Method can be multiple uh, things, can be based on spatial statistics. We can use machine learning algorithms for that. We can um, automatic image recognition um, algorithms. And the hope is that we can produce a map that indicates for each, for a patch, or allows the statement, or oh, this patch is a high density area with mixed use, or this is a medium density area with commercial use. I never see where the pointer is actually. <laughs> well, multiple questions arise here. Like what framework for functional types can we use? Um, what frameworks do exist? What do we need to add to those frameworks to be applicable for material stock mapping? Um, what is a homogeneous settlement or a homogeneous neighborhood and how large is a homogeneous uh, settlement or neighborhood? Um, and is that different over regions? I think it certainly is, but we don't have proof. Um, and what, what other data may provide indicators uh, for settlement functions? I mean, a lot of studies are working with nighttime lights. Um, I'm not a great fan of nighttime lights, but for distinguishing a rather rural place from a rather urban place without wanting to go in that definition issue of urban and rural here, um, that might be helpful. And then in the last step, use the knowledge that we have from social ecology to link that information to material stocks. So for example, from the functional types or other variables that we created, um, build a rule set or use a rule set um, to derive material stock quantities from that. And we Fallen, um, oh, no, it's all right. <laughs> um, and the questions that, that, that come from here are even like uh, more, how do you say, um, more basic than when we talk about functional types. Like alone, the, what are the target variables that we can map and that correspond to material stocks? Um, what might be a framework for settlement typology? I mentioned that. Um, how can we relate settlement characteristics to stock? Like what is the role of regional differences? Mm, which is much more important when you go into interpretation than when you go into physical mapping. What is the thematic accuracy that we want to have and what is the methodologi methodological flexibil flexibility that we want to keep? So that aims at transferability and generalization. So I'm always a fan of, fan of flexibility, but um, Accuracy might be something that we cannot even like provide at very high detail with the data that we have globally. 
what is the role of socioeconomic factors? Do we need that here in the characteristics? Do, are socioeconomic factors even a thing when it's about functional types? Do we have to include that here? Um, and yeah, what, what can and can we not see with remote sensing? And I'm very happy for your questions. Thank you. It's supposed to be material stock quantities. So whatever the quantity is, but in this case, it doesn't mean anything because it's a mock-up. So this is what we think it's about to, to look like. Um, but here you can imagine like the quantities of materials um, in shades of red. A lot of that is conceptual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's why I say that you can skip high school with this. And then that being said, uh, I, was, I was thinking a little bit whether for uh, an assessor this doesn't very much, but would it be important to have some kind of a dynamic perspective as well? Because if you all talk together and it ends up in sprawling or no. being a bandit or um, not meant to be. And uh, because that, I think, it's relating it now to your case of circulation of materials. Yeah, um, temporal dynamics is, is really interesting. Um, first, we always need to see what, what data do we have available. Um, the data that we use with, uh, that we work with, well, Sent Copernicus Sentinel program is here since 2013. We have full coverage since 2017. So that will not so much work historically. Historically, we have, for example, the, the Landsat program, which offers about 40 years, 50 years of, of imagery at 30 meter resolution. Um, and apart from that, it becomes really difficult. Um, we, we did historic analysis, a, a, a bit of historic land cover for uh, different places <coughs> um, experimentally. You have to see that in Central Europe, not so much is happening in the last 40 years. Um, that becomes really interesting when you go to emerging places such as um, Asia, for example. Um, yeah, that's definitely a really interesting thing. But then it's also about um, uh, computation power. So when we apply that kind of regression models um, for the whole of Germany, that takes about five days to calculate um, at that 10 meter resolution. Like 30 meter resolution is well, theoretically nine times faster than that. Um, but yeah, it's that, that's a, an issue of time and, and resources and computation. But it's, well, yeah. Yeah, no, that is that is really true. Like when I when I say, oh, this this is uh, more useful than that. That always depends for for special cases. And the the global human settlement layer is there, I think, for four time steps or five time steps uh, in history since 1970 something. Um, thank you. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Always ask the expert. Many, many Hello everybody, my name is Fritz Wittmann. I'm from the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences Vienna. And the topic of the presentation is modeling food system scenarios for a sustainable food provision of Vienna. And I also thank uh, my colleagues who I'm working with who are listed here. And uh, this study deals with agricultural area that supplies food for the urban population. Uh, the outline of this presentation is that I first show you some, some background and objectives. Then I show you modeled food system scenarios that we defined, a definition of the study region, the used model framework, a comparison of land use, and a, a summary at the end. Uh, the background of this study is that it's challenging to provide food and ecosystem services for a growing urban uh, population and there is a large number of interactions between the urban and rural entities, for example, flows, money or people and food ha habits are here a key factor to for an effective use of the resource of agricultural land. And here you see a map of Austria. Here is Vienna. And the brown area is Arable land. So uh, Vienna is mainly surrounded by Arable land. So this makes it suitable for some uh, food system scenarios. The objectives of this study are to model different food system scenarios and to quantify uh, ecological impacts, for example, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and the question whether a regionalization of the food system can contribute to lower greenhouse gas emissions. And we also quantify economic impact, uh, for example, the farm production choices or changes in the land, in the agricultural land use or uh, in the fertilizer use. And therefore we investigate these scenarios and uh, look which of them are possible. And for the scenarios, we use three different key factors. The first one is uh, to define a a regional uh, area where the food comes mainly from to fulfill the demand of the city. Uh, the second one is to increase the, uh, the organic uh, consumption. So currently we have a consumption share of 9% for organic products and we increase that to 100%. And the third factor is to decrease the meat consumption from 70 kilogram per person and year to 20 kilogram per person and year. So these factors count for the Viennese inhabitants. And when we combine these factors, we receive seven different uh, scenarios and also the current state here. And these scenarios can be either constant or they condition they have is active. And in modeling, we often use such extreme scenarios uh, because they are likely to show clear effects. And uh, yeah, what I also want to say here, uh, these three scenarios are used because they are uh, 
often and generally uh, suggested to reduce the uh, greenhouse gas emission. Now for the uh, first factor, first key factor, we have to define a regional food supply area and therefore we made five proposals with different radii around Vienna and uh, we choose the radius of 100 kilo kilometers around Vienna because uh, we want to include diverse farm practices and with a smaller radius than 100 kilometers, uh, the cattle uh, and the grassland uh, volumes would be too low for a, a partially um, partially covering the food demand of Vienna. And it's not a straightforward thing to define a region because the concept of regionality is, has several meanings and it, it depends on the frame we are using. Here is again the region shown and the border here is demarcated on a municipality level and the neighboring countries here are not included because of data availability issues. Uh, now we want to translate the food demand into uh, land use and therefore we built uh, two models. One model on the supply side, this is an, uh, an farm economic model and another model on the demand side, this is a biomass balancing model and we now calculate the food demand for the people uh, who live in this area and then calculate it back uh, how much land use is needed to, uh, to cover this food demand. And we also brought in a survey in the for the supply side uh, to ask the farmers whether they are willing uh, to change their production for these different scenarios. And when they not want to change the production, we don't uh, include them in the uh, model. And the data for the food consumption here is from, uh, from nutritional recommendations. Uh, here you see some preliminary results. Uh, there are three bars in this graph. I begin with the third bar here. Uh, you see here the required land use for meat reduced consumption. This is when we go back to this combination. It's the third scenario. So we have here the condition of regional food supply which is active here and also the reduced meat consumption condition is active. So when we compare, compare now uh, the, thir the third bar with the first bar, we see that it would be possible with the current uh, available land uh, to feed the people in this region with, uh, le with less meat. But if we want to feed the people in the region with uh, the consumption that we have now, this would not be possible because of the, uh, the natural production characteristics in the region. So we don't have enough land to uh, fulfill the condition of self-sufficiency for this region. And what we don't see here is, but it's included in the arable crops, is that for the 
uh, industry requirements and industry production, we need a lot of oil seed for biofuel. And this is a bit problematic because when we want to produce more oil seeds, uh, we would need to change uh, the crop rotation requirements. And uh, it's not easy to do it for the for current crop rotations. So, and the larger share of grassland in the other, in these two bars means uh, that now uh, the grassland is produced in the western parts of Austria, most of them. And if we want to include them in the current region, uh, we would need to convert some arable land to grassland. Now the summary and some open questions. Uh, I begin with the summary. The, the we combined two models and show if proposed uh, scenarios are possible. And with this combination of the models, we can, uh, we can actually look if the scenarios are really sustainable for the farms and with the comparison of the land use, we saw that the re reduced meat consumption is possible for uh, self-sufficiency of this region, but the current consumption is not possible with, with this region. And some open questions are how the food processing in the region can be included in the model because the processing needs some infrastructure. And other questions are how much greenhouse gas emissions does transport cause and what are the implications uh, for the farmers if the conditions change there are in. Yeah, thank you for your attention. So first, especially for me, uh, I'm not saying we, 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 we need to eat more meat and less meat, yeah. uh, or less green. I don't think mm -hmm. that it's not a farm. Yeah. Because meat is far away from the city, so if you are taking only 50 kilometers, of course you are not taking into account the, the, the yeah. grassland. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And why 50 kilometers from Vienna? To so it's uh, 100 kilometers and as I said, the definition is not straightforward. So we looked at the land use with data from the uh, from the IACS, it's Integrated Administration and Control System of the Federal Ministry of Austria for Agriculture. And there we compared the land use within these uh, five proposals and we chose 100 kilometers because 
we want to see clear uh, or strong effects of the scenarios, but we also want to cover uh, the food demand at least partially, yeah, that's the reason. And we also want to include cattle, livestock and organic manure. And the other comment was about uh, the willingness of farmers. It's not here, but we also conducted a survey uh, to uh, include this willingness for farm of farmers to change their farm practices. And uh, I said that before, if they don't want to change anything, they will not be modeled in the farm economic model here. Yeah, but for how much how many farmers? Yeah. How many how much basis because because they didn't plant this if they are not taking the account, they they didn't change. Yeah. So for for these calculations this survey hasn't been taken into account, yeah. Thank you. In the survey, we asked them if they want to uh, change the production, and if they change, we assume that they only produce for Vienna, but also for the, uh, I forgot to say that, also the people in this region are feed by themselves. Yeah. Christian can comment something here <laughs> from this project. Hello, good morning to everybody. So I am presenting here on the influence of gasoline price on the urban sprawl. We used the uh, uh, data we will discuss later. I, uh, we are doing with one of uh, my colleague who is a, also a co-chair here in the Felix. And currently I'm located at the University of Glasgow. So what's the overall motivation for this study? If you see throughout the world, sprawl is the one of the challenges because of consumption. We consume a lot of energy based on the sprawl. And when we see the global models, it's, it's showing that most uh, future growth will be more sprawl rather than compact. When Seto did uh, a lot of studies on the, on the um, on overall uh, global uh, expansion of population growth versus the uh, explore growth, and he said, "Oh, no, it's not." Uh, she said, "It's not. Uh, it's more. Future would not be more compact, but it will be more explore." And to limit the explore, we have uh, several strategies in urban planning and more like national planning. And so, for example, build environment regulations of con uh, and control have been opted, but we have uh, got uh, limited uh, success there. Though studies, previous studies have suggested that uh, increasing the gasoline price will reduce the energy consumption or emissions, 
uh, through restructuring urban farms and that kind of thing. So we will investigate that kind of systems. For example, a previous study, the Felix ETL, where uh, Felix and colleagues, where he said, uh, what are the overall global cities consumptions? And he said, when he did a typology of the cities globally, so, so of course, population density is one of the classifier, but also gasoline price is also classifier. So within uh, less than the gasoline price and the higher than the gasoline price. So for example, here the consumption energy per capita consumption is 201 GJ per population, uh, uh, 201. And it's also vary from uh, like uh, from 103 to 201. And it's more gasoline than 140. So it's a lot of uh, gasoline price is one of the uh, classifier for the this kind of consumption. In his another studies where his, he look on the significant vari variation of the fuel taxes on the overall energy consumption, for example. And if, and if you see the ACI has a much more uh, effects of the direct energy consumption the, uh, with time. So it's, it will impact a lot on the overall fuel taxes and on the energy consumption. One of the studies in the, uh, published by the Board of ETL, where he said optimal energy taxation, real estate taxes, as well as com commuting taxes, re reduce transportation, and generate a more compact city. So there are many studies from one city to another city discussing on that. But what's the current studies? Either they are city specific, uh, where, where they measure the urban space structure, but uh, not on a global scales, and a few studies which deals with that, which uses mostly the cross-sectional study. Some uses longitudinal studies as well as in regional context, for example, in Spain, in uh, Canadian city, metropolitan cities, as well as some US uh, urbanized area. So here overall our research question is whether and to what extent transport fuel prices affect compact urban forms. And to address these questions, we have uh, two objectives where we are, where, where we have two objectives where uh, we are measuring the determinants of the percentage share of population living in high built up global areas in global cities as well as US states. And second, we measure the percentage of share of area, built area and the, and the high built up area in, again, the global cities and the US states. So, uh, for the U.S. Uh, global cities, we have used 282 cities. And for the U.S. states, we have almost all major states, 51. We have used longitudinal data for the global cities, like 90, 2000, 2014, corresponding to this uh, yesterday per, uh, you presented and that, uh, global human settlements. For U.S. states, we have a, a gasoline price uh, for the even 1975. So we use the 1975, 1990, 2000, and 2014 data. So it's more temporal. Also for US states, we have little bit additional data sets. Uh, for example, um, congestions and all this in, in temporal context. So we use the uh, more, uh, we have extracted the variables from the, this uh, data sets. And the beauty of this data set is that it's comparable across the cities over time. Other, if we could have done other, use other data sets, we could not have uh, done that kind of a study. So overall, we have used 282 cities. Earlier, it's uh, basically based on the, one of the studies from Nangani uh, ETN, where she has used uh, 343 uh, uh, cities. Uh, uh, but our colleague Ulf uh, has done like some of the, he collapsed some of the cities because they are very near to each other. Uh, in one, and finally, we got a data set of 282 cities. We have used a panel regression models where, where I, uh, I is the cities and T is the time. And so we, have, we, we could do much better than the non-panel uh, regressions. So overall, the, our data sets, data sources is, so we have a like, so it's global cities and U.S. states. All I, already I discussed about this. Diesel prices come from the World Bank data sets. It's country-level data. 
gasoline prices also come from the World Bank data sets. Uh, for the US, it's coming from the U US Energy Information Administration, EIA, same. GDP per capita comes from the, again, World Bank and Bureau of Economic Analysis for the US states. And nodal degree, one of the studies uh, where we compare the, what are the road sections, it's like dead ends, cul-de-sacs, or it's a three, or it's more than four and four plus. So it's come from the open state maps, but that's, uh, and for the US, it's uh, one of the very nice study from the Bennington system. So if we see the overall the global cities and the US states, what we find that percentage of the population in high built up area has increased over time. This is the high built up area, it's increased over time. Also in the US states, uh, no, it's a, it's a percentage of a high area in the high built up area, it's also increased. But when we see the US states, uh, it's a percentage population has increased, but this, uh, the percentage area almost little bit decreased or almost it's a, almost constant. So we did the, the pan, uh, results suggest that, the first result is that fuel price versus compact development. If we increase a 10% in, uh, increase in gasoline price, it's, uh, it's uh, reduces, uh, it increases the overall percentage of population in a high built up area. It's uh, about uh, 0.14 percentage points. And if we increase the same, uh, so it's uh, in the high built up area, it's increased almost 0.1%. And similarly, if we increase, we test also the diesel, diesel prices. It's a different model for the uh, diesel and gasoline. So a 10% increase in diesel prices increases about 0.08 percentage point of the share of the population living in the high built up area, but we didn't find any significant result for the uh, percentage of area in the high bil built up area. So perhaps the price of the gasoline matters more than the price of diesel, but we have to look how we, it's working. If you see the income, uh, once income is increasing, so we are expecting that uh, percentage of area in high, uh, high built up area will increase, it's significant. So one, uh, it's also the, some uh, kind of relationship where income increase people move to the more dense area or more dense area produces more income. So it's like kind of cyclic relationship. If you see the population, of course population increasing, it increases the overall compact urban forms. So we, exactly to quantity is there. When we see the US states, little bit different uh, result from the, uh, from the global cities. Here we find that a 10% increase in gasoline prices increase about 0.7 percent increase in the share population living in the high built up area. So it's log log, earlier was not a log log uh, because of model, uh, model better, better predictivity. So it's uh, about 10 percent if you increase gasoline price about uh, 0.7 percent increase in the uh, high built up area. We didn't find any significant result from the uh, people move to the uh, percentage, uh, people move to the more dense uh, built areas. Also, we see the pop increasing population makes more pop people in the high, uh, high built up area. But one result, uh, what was surprising result was that when we, we did hear the time fixed effects because of model uh, specifications, and over time, it's uh, in reference to time, uh, it's uh, the percentage area in the high built up area is decreasing over time. So that's also one of the, in US states, but in, uh, we didn't, uh, but in uh, global cities, we didn't find that one. So it's also a little bit uh, surprising or a little bit maybe very much interesting. US has a little bit different kind of system and it's uh, like, it's US state level data, not city level. So it may have a little bit different impact. So what we can conclude with that? So we, our study conclude the monocentric model of urban land use where transport fuel prices increases the share of population or share of area living in high built up area. Oh, and this result suggests that fuel taxes could be useful to limit urban expo if else kept like uh, fixed. And uh, in future, we want to see the more, more better models by estimating a spatial panel data model because we have location of the cities so we can do the spatial panel model. 
And we also want to identify the regional effects, such as Asian cities may be one reason, another reason, and different kind of reasons. And also, we see the, some kind of simulations where what would happen by 230 or by 250 if the gasoline price, some, if we influence some kind of gasoline prices. So we will see more a broader picture. Thank you very much for your Thank concern. You very much.